Thank you. All right, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Professor Brian Colgill, the University of Texas at Austin uh, Energy Institute Director. Uh, Brian has been uh, very prolific over his career, who started at the University of California at Los Angeles, where he completed his studies, undergraduate and then PhD studies there. He moved uh, to Dublin, where he did his postdoctorate. He wanted, you know, he, he was involved in activities, research activities, which at that time, back in late 90s, were sort of pioneering the nano scale of materials, nano materials, and so forth. He moved to Dublin, where there was a research activity there in the chemistry department, where he completed his postdoctoral studies, and then he came back to the US, uh, where he started his academic career at the University of Texas at Austin, going through the ranks, uh, of course, and now he holds the Acid Engineering Residence from the chair there, director of the Texas NM of the UT. Uh, you know, again, <laughs> the, uh, the links, there will be links on the for the course, you know, so and we can exchange the uh, post from time to time. Uh, then UT, he also directs the UT Energy, the Center for Solar Power Futures. This is a topic he will talk uh, about it later on in his presentation. And he also leads an industry university research center co-funded by National Science Foundation and the UT collaborative program with uh, Portugal. He, he essentially, uh, his research is at the interfaces of nano and meso scale uh, materials and uh, processes which enable us to harvest and deliver energy solutions. And he will hear some exciting things that he seen has been developing over the years. He has also, uh, you know, he has an entrepreneurship side into, uh, you know, having funded uh, two companies or having uh, started up and uh, founded two companies, uh, InnovaLite, which was a California-based company, which later on was acquired by DuPont, I think, right? and. Uh, very successful, and then Pino Technologies, which is more like a startup at early phases, and we wish him all the best luck for this. You know, entrepreneurship is something very important, linking academic excellence also to technology practice. He's also an artist, you know, so essentially bringing another dimension, so he's very multidimensional. So he essentially explores, you know, uh, the in collaboration language and human, human artificial intelligence interactions. So essentially bringing science and arts uh, together in innovative ways. He has been highly uh, recognized with many awards. I would like to highlight the 2012 uh, professional program, the very prestigious professional progress award from the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. And in 2018, he was elected in the National Academy of Engineers. He will touch upon the, in his presentation, he will touch upon the opportunities that we have for solar power for a sustainable energy future. Please welcome in a nice way, Professor Brian <laughs> Uh, Thanks for the introduction. It's good to be at Texas A&M. Um, so what I wanted to do is give a, a pretty broad overview and perspective about solar and, and some of my perspective about how it's changing society and, and some of the technological challenges uh, in that. So, um, so that's the topic uh, of my talk. So um, all the companies, even ExxonMobil, has net zero carbon emissions ambitions. So uh, the need for this uh, is undisputed. So governmental agents, governments around the world, companies of all, all forms 
are uh, striving to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so why? Um, we, we all know. So we, we have, uh, you know, depending on who you talk, talk to uh, about the like, impacts of climate change, air quality, whatnot, there are significant um, challenges that, that we're trying to solve. So underlying this is the fact that CO2 emissions continue to grow around the world. Um, nobody's going to stop using energy. So if you look at uh, energy consumption, CO2 emissions, uh, energy consumption will continue to grow. So energy consumption uh, correlates with, with economic prosperity. There's no country that's really going to cut their energy use. And if you talk about um, countries that are that are developing economically, they're going to continue to expand their energy use. So how do we how do we deal with that and get to the net zero greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, future? Okay, so we need uh, technologies, policies, carbon capture, carbon management. It would really be helpful if we could do direct air capture uh, and convert CO two to usable things um, with very little energy. Okay, so you don't have a net positive energy input to capture CO2 and, and make something else. Um, low carbon energy sources. So we're talking about wind, solar, geothermal, maybe clean hydrogen, and then uh, decarbonization of industrial processes. So how do we decarbonize cement making, steel making? All of these are huge challenges if we're gonna get to a uh, future with net zero carbon emissions. So solar is, is fundamental to this. We're, we're not going to get to a future with net zero carbon emissions without significant adoption of solar. Um, one thing going for us is the price of solar, the price of wind has continued to, to drop significantly. Um, I direct a, a research center on solar. It's called the Center for a Solar Powered Future, SPF 2050. And just over the 12, 13 year life of that uh, research center, the solar industry is transformed from uh, utility scale solar being not cost, cost competitive with natural gas. And the general idea that we're it's going to be a challenge to ever compete with natural gas to now being solar is the, the lowest cost form of electricity. Okay, so um, the, the economics have shifted. And so how is that going to impact uh, uh, what we do? The general public still wonders, is solar really inexpensive? Uh, there's a significant portion of, of the general public that thinks solar is a weird, strange technological thing that really maybe doesn't exist in the way it does. Um, but, it's, but it's somewhat complicated. So when we talk about uh, level up, levelized cost of electricity of solar being cost competitive with natural gas, that's utility scale solar, so huge, Solar farms, 300 megawatt, 500 megawatt kind of solar farms. Uh, if we talk about residential solar, that is not cost competitive with, with natural gas. Okay, so depending on uh, how you're using solar, the scale, it's either competitive or not. Most people know of solar in terms of rooftop solar, um, and maybe not the general public not understanding the difference between utility scale versus residential, but that that's that's really important, okay? Um, right now, without subsidies, uh, so this is the Zard uh, report a lot of people refer to, without subsidies, levelized cost of electricity of utility scale solar is uh, cheaper than natural gas, okay? Um, so do, does that mean we're just gonna go out and build a bunch of solar farms and problem solve? Uh, no, okay? So just to do a thought experiment, if we think about how much energy and electricity is used in Texas, uh, we've got about 365.1 terawatt hours of electric power. Um, well, in energy, you've got all these things. Uh, electric power generation, 429.8 terawatt hours, okay? So you, the way we consume like, uh, energy, there's like fuels, fuel for your car, gasoline, that sort of thing. And then there's electricity. So what if we, uh, for example, blanketed university lands with solar? There's 2.1 million acres. It's there for the public good. Why don't we just put massive solar farms on, on university lands? What, what, does, that, what does that mean? Okay. 
If you did that, uh, you'd have about 1,800 uh, terawatt hours uh, per year. That's about four times the electricity we need in Texas, okay? Um, if you consider also the energy and you electrify everything, you could, you could accommodate that. If you think about the oil and gas revenue on UT lands from uh, going to the, the puff, it's about a billion dollars a year. Um, you would make about $32 billion a year if you blanketed universal lands with solar. So why not just do that? Uh, you need about $800 billion uh, to do it. So that, that's a challenge. So when you think about, um, <coughs> Well, among others. So that is one challenge, very capital, awesome, intensive. If you have the $800 billion blanket university lands, then you can make a lot of money, but then you have other, other challenges. Can the electrical grid really handle all solar for all the electricity? The sun only shines during the day, doesn't shine at night. Uh, there's more sunshine in the summer than the winter. So you have these challenges of intermittency uh, as well, okay? If, uh, again, if you did have the $800 billion, it would probably take about 24 years or so with 0% interest loan, which you couldn't get right now, um, for sure, uh, to, to pay that back, all right? Um, solar facilities only last about 30 years, so they're only guaranteed for 30, depending on your technology, it can be even, even less. So can you make your money back with that, that capital investment uh, over time. And some of this uh, cost is due to the fact that there's some technology, technological problems, like the inverters only last 10 years. So your solar farm lasts about 30 years, but you have to replace all the inverters in your solar farm every 10 years. And that adds to a lot of costs uh, as well. So those are, those are some of the cha major challenges. Capital cost intensive, you also need the land. Do you really want to blanket university lands and you know can cattle graze there? Things like that. There are lots of issues with the questions about land use, intermittency. How do you do uh, long duration energy storage that are that are unsolved problems? So these are uh, these are challenges. Um, one good thing is that large scale. Energy storage plus utility scale solar, the cost of that's continuing to come down. It's not quite cost competitive with natural gas, but it but it's getting more and more cost competitive. So uh, if you can now have massive amounts of electricity that could um, could meet your total energy needs, uh, how do you do that? You have chemical refineries that require process heating and things like that, that you're using natural gas to burn them. Um, can you just electrify everything? That's another major uh, obstacle and challenge to, to using solar for everything. So what are the pathways to decarbonization? Why don't we just put in a bunch of solar, electrify everything? Um, that's what people are talking about. But there, there are major challenges with uh, with just doing that. Okay, um, so to, so to back up a little bit, I think it it helps understand like what is a solar cell, what's the technology, what's the state of the art at the moment. Uh, when we talk about uh, the power output of a solar cell, we care about the power conversion efficiency. That's the amount of electrical power that's directly converted from the the sunlight. So what are the fundamental limits to that? Uh, can you convert 100% of the sunlight power into electrical power? You, you can't, there are fundamental limits uh, to doing that. So you have freely available uh, sunlight, but you have solar cell materials that, that cost money, and then you have installation, maintenance, and oper opportunities. In general, higher efficiency devices are more expensive to make, uh, but then you're, create, you're generating more power with the sun that lowers the balance of systems costs, operation and maintenance. So there are um, a number of different technologies that are available for solar cells. This is the NREL uh, efficiency map over time, going back to the, the 1970s. Uh, and so the highest efficiency devices up at the top of the chart up there, those are multi-junction solar cells. The record right now are six junction solar cells under 143 
uh, times concentrated sunlight. Okay, and you can get very, very high efficiency, almost 50% efficiency of converting the sunlight to power. But those are extremely expensive to make. Uh, also, the, the manufacturing processes are limited to small areas. So when you think about solar panels, you think large, large area panels on your roof and that sort of thing. So uh, you, can, you can make these very, very high efficiency devices, but you're limited by area and they're very expensive. So those things are used on satellites. Uh, and they have a place, but not for terrestrial markets because they're too, they're too expensive. Over time, over the last 10 years, uh, so I guess you can't really see the, the time frame over there, but um, this is about 2010 uh, to 2022. Over the last 10 years, there have actually been several new types of materials and technologies that have been developed that are, that are um, making their way into commercial manufacturing. Perovskites are an example, organic photovoltaics, photovoltaics made of organic materials are working better and better, different kinds of nanocrystal inks, um, the fundamental record efficiency of silicon, even though it's a fairly mature technology has actually gone up somewhat significantly over the last 10 years. Cadmium telluride has uh, had a revolution over the last 10 or 15 years. So a lot has happened in terms of uh, uh, photovoltaic device development. So a solar cell made of a semiconductor, okay, you've got your semiconductor, uh, that's what absorbs light. When the light's absorbed, uh, you basically pop a conduction electron out of the valence band into the conduction band and leave behind a hole. So the light's absorbed by the semiconductor, create a, an electron and a hole, and those, uh, charge carriers need to get swept out of the semiconductor before they recombine. Okay. So you can't make a solar cell just out of one semiconductor. You have to have a built in voltage due to the interfacing between two different semiconductors. So when people talk about Solar cells, we tend to talk about the main light absorber like silicon or cadmium telluride. In a cadmium telluride solar cell, it's actually cadmium telluride that does the majority of the light absorption and it's interfaced with cadmium sulfide. But cadmium sulfide material is important to create this built in uh, voltage that is what gives rise to the photovoltaic effect. In silicon, you're doping part of the silicon P type or with, with holes and the other part with electrons that creates a, a built-in uh, voltage in that material. So, so the solar cell doesn't just have one semiconductor, it's got a, a junction in it. So that's, that's important to know. Okay, so electrons go one way and holes go the other due to this. And then you need to extract the electron hole to get electricity out. So you need, uh, you need electrodes, you need a, a metal on both sides. If you're talking about a solar cell, you need the light to be able to get through one of the electrodes into the solar cell. So you can either pattern your metal lines and leave space available. Um, the common material that's really important for solar cells is transparent conductive oxides. So glass that's electrically conductive, but also transparent. So solar cells aren't especially complex devices. They're not as complicated as transistors these days, uh, but they, they require more than one semiconductor. So it's a semiconductor, another semiconductor of some sort. You have uh, these uh, metal contacts. In cadmium telluride devices, it's actually the contact between the, the metal uh, layer and the cadmium telluride that limits the device efficiency for, for those solar cells right now. Okay, it has nothing to do with how you process the cadmium telluride. It's that there's a, an energy barrier between for a whole extraction for cadmium telluride. So all of these different um, layers can, can, can cause a problem. And then you need this to be mechanically supported. So your solar cells, if you're putting them out on the roof, you want them to be pretty robust. Uh, you don't want a hailstorm to come and tear up your, your solar cells. You want them to blow off the roof and things like that. So that, that's important. But this is the basic design of every, every solar cell. 
Okay. So what is the maximum efficiency of a solar cell? Uh, it's called the Shockley, Shockley Quasar limit. The fundamental limit is 34% for a single junction solar cell. And the reason for that is that if the photon energy is lower than the band gap of the material, the photon's not absorbed, it's just transparent um, to that material. When you shrink the band gap of the material, the photon energy is conserved. You create a, a hot electron or hot hole, and then that electron and hole immediately relax to the the bandage here, and you lose this energy. It's called thermalization. So there's a optimum band gap, which is about 1.3 electron volts or so for, for a semiconductor, uh, where you can reach that, uh, that maximum 34%. So silicon has a you know, not quite perfectly tuned band gap for the shockley Quasar limit to get to this 34%, but it's okay. It's around 1.1 EV. Cadmium telluride's a little bit, a little bit better. Uh, if you look at a semiconductor like germanium, the band gap of germanium is six, seven eV. It's on the near infrared. You can make solar cells with germanium, but they're not going to be particularly efficient. So germanium is used in the solar cell industry to make multi-junction solar cells, especially with more silicon or with other kinds of three, five semiconductors. So these near-infrared absorbing materials and more in the blue are important for the multi-junction cells, okay? So by stacking semiconductors with different band gaps, uh, you can absorb the high energy photons, then the rest of the light comes through that, the next, you take the next cut of, uh, of photons, and then the next, and by that you can get around the shock of Pfizer limit. So all silicon solar cells are manufactured in China right now. So that was a huge transition in the solar industry around 2008 or so. Um, silicon manufacturing moved from Europe, moved to the United States, uh, to, to China. Um, we have one really strong uh, company in the world that makes cadmium telluride solar cells called First Solar, and it's an American company. So if you... Have ever wondered about these debates about tariffs on solar cells? A lot of it comes down to the fact that uh, silicon dominates globally about 85% of the market. Solar cells, they're all manufactured in China. The other 15% or so is cadmium telluride manufactured by First Solar, which is an American company. Cadmium telluride is not used for residential solar. You don't have cadmium telluride solar cells on your, on your roof. It's all for utility scale. So if you are a homeowner, you're going to be buying silicon solar cells. If you're a utility, uh, you might buy silicon, but you probably will buy cadmium telluride as well. So uh, because of the tariffs over the last few years, cadmium telluride in the United States uh, makes up about 40% of the market. The solar cell market. There are advantages of cadmium telluride over silicon. So how you make your solar cell really, really matters uh, a lot. In silicon manufacturing, it requires a lot of high temperature processing. There's a lot of chemical waste. Silicon is very abundant on the Earth's surface, but you have to purify it uh, to make solar cells. The reason that silicon solar cells are cost competitive with cadmium telluride is that um, the the manufacturing process is highly subsidized by the Chinese government. And uh, in First Solar as an American company, they don't have the same subsidies. But cadmium telluride manufacturing, it's essentially a roll-to-roll -roll process. You float this glass um, through, through the facility. Uh, so we don't tend to think of roll-to-roll -roll as glass processing. A lot of people think of it as plastic substrates, but this is a roll-to-roll -roll process. These glass substrates are flying through the production facility. Uh, you sublime cadmium telluride, you sublime cadmium sulfide, then cadmium telluride onto the, onto the conducting glass, the transparent conducting glass um, coated material. Uh, and, and because you don't need really high purity cadmium telluride, it can be polycrystalline. That processing is very, very inexpensive. So this is back in 2018. There's this uh, Bloomberg 
uh, report looking at the financial sort of stability of all of these solar companies. And most of them are indicated by red and orange for other companies. But um, if you're below this 1.1 level, you have the risk of bankruptcy in two years. So all of these, all the solar companies were at risk of bankruptcy in two years in 2018. Thank goodness that didn't happen to all these companies. But the only company that was financially viewed as financially stable by Bloomberg back in 2018 was First Solar. And the reason for that is the, the ability to manufacture at scale at low cost solar cells. And the reason for that is those solar cells are made of cadmium telluride and not silicon. Okay, so when we're thinking about the future of solar, what your solar panels are made of is, uh, is important. And um, yeah, so I think the tariff laws have, have changed somewhat recently. So we'll see what that does, uh, does to the market in the US. So the future of solar. Um, so I started working on solar. This line is 2005, okay? And around that time, the, the first company that I had started called the Nobelite was initially a lighting company. We were making silicon quantum dots, making light emitting diodes out of those. And then around 2005, we pivoted to solar, made a, a silicon ink. Uh, a new Nobelite grew to be about 85 employees. It started in Austin, moved to Minneapolis for like a year, then moved to the Bay Area and just kept, kept growing. Uh, they made a, a product called a uh, silicon ink. So you take single crystal silicon solar cells, you'd put this silicon ink kind of on top of it, and then you would throw it in a furnace um, and anneal that material and make something called a selective emitter device. And so by doing that, you could increase the efficiency of your uh, single crystal silicon solar cell by about two to 3% without increasing the cost really of what you were manufacturing. So, um, so in my career, I've, I've looked for things like that. Are there add-ons you can add to a solar cell to increase efficiency one or two or three percent without increasing manufacturing costs? And that two percent can often be the difference between dominating the market in solar with your product and, and not. Okay, so um, when when I was working on this, I started to get really interested in solar. Um, I think what Enoblite was doing was interesting, but this 2% incremental increase in, in efficiency wasn't that satisfying to me as, a, as an academic. So I started thinking about, are there ways to like radically change how solar cells are made? So these are nanocrystals. This is an ink of copperindium selenide. We can add gallium, copperindium gallium selenide. It's called SIGS. So if you go back in time to 2005, out of the two thin film materials competing with silicon. There was cadmium telluride and there was SIGs. Everyone was putting their money on SIGs to, to work out. Um, cadmium telluride had a lot of issues in 2005. Uh, there was a big discovery made around that time period where if you sprinkle a little copper into cadmium telluride, you could make the solar cell material stable under light for a long time. That enabled for solar to become what first solar was uh, or is today. Uh, but back in 2005, no one really knew how to stabilize cadmium telluride over, over a long time. Okay. Uh, SIGs was a little bit different, uh, but the problem with SIGs is you would deposit vapor deposit copper, indium, and gallium, and then you would throw that into a furnace under selenium vapor or hydrogen selenide at about 650C, convert that to SIGs, and then you can make solar cells. No one figured out how to make that process cost effective. So all these six companies that were around in 2005, they've all gone bankrupt over time. Um, one of the last outliers was Solar Frontier, which is a Japanese company, and I'm not sure they're around anymore. Um, so in the end, having Telluride uh, became what it is today. Six sort of dropped off the map. But we were making these nanocrystals, and uh, so we've thought about different forms of solar cells. How can you harvest light? You've got utility scale solar, you have residential solar, commercial scale solar. So solar on like Walmarts and things like that. Um, what about solar that you can wear? And we know solar cells, I mean, you have the little, little solar strip on your calculators, not, not anymore, but you see. Um, so, you know, how do you have 
solar for for uh, general products and consumer products and stuff like that. So that's something we've worked at. Uh, another thing that we've thought a lot about, and this has been on the roadmap of the center I direct, is making a new type of technology, which is thin film multi-junction solar cells. So how do you take the manufacturing processes for cadmium telluride, and maybe six, and how do you apply that to multiple multi-junctions to get to higher efficiency devices without increasing the uh, the efficiency, and that's still uh, a technology target, okay? So ubiquitous thermal tech power, how do you do that? How do you make solar windows? And there, there's, a really, there's a really interesting time period. People can make solar windows. It's not that we can't. Um, you have solar, solar glass or greenhouses that you can buy and things like that. How, how, will, that, how will that all be used? So thinking about agrivoltaics, electric vehicles, uh, community solar, thinking about issues related to equity, um, what role can microgrids play, can you create microgridded communities based on residential solar, all of these are uh, really interesting topics right now. So this is the, the Solar Cell Research Center that I direct, um, that's Sam Path from Colorado State, uh, call, it was at Colorado State where they figured out this little sprinkling of copper uh, stabilizes cadmium telluride. And so in the solar center, we have companies that range from car manufacturers like BMW uh, to like traditional oil and gas companies, which are becoming power companies like Shell, Sonova is the largest solar uh, residential solar installer in Texas. Uh, so all of these companies are kind of coming together, thinking about the future. Um, so I just want to say some time. A um, couple things that we're, we're thinking about in the center. So this is work, uh, collaborative work with Michael Baldea, my colleague who does systems work. So one project we have is looking at um, weather forecasting. So when you have utility scale solar farms, clouds come over and that really pretty dramatically impacts the power output from a solar panel. So how do you, how do you monitor that? How do you predict that? And, and you want to know, uh, you want to know about that. Okay, so you might have your uh, irradiance here. How do you predict that? So this is, these are the kinds of fluctuations you can have on in a solar farm. Okay, people don't fully know how to deal with those. And this is a real issue. Um, if you're a utility in a certain market, um, if you're, change in power output exceeds some threshold rate, you get charged a penalty uh, by like ERCOT. Okay, so you might be going along predicting your power output, and then all of a sudden the power output drops, some cloud comes over. And if you're outside of that range of tolerance and you, you can't kind of start ramping down your, your power output uh, in anticipation of that, you get, you get hit with a fine. So how do you, how do you, um, how do you do that? So this is uh, work that we're doing. Uh, so we have some sensors out in the field that can monitor cloud cover. And then we have a model for that. And here you can see like this, this is the prediction over time. And you see a spike and a change in uh, power output. So how, how can we better, uh, better address that? How can we minimize those errors in our, our prediction? So a lot of it has to do with um, how we take pictures, the image, so it's partly data, but it's also data processing um, and algorithms. Okay, so instead of having 10 minute resolution where you're looking at clouds and you have one minute resolution, that's a bit of a data problem and a computing power problem. Um, but fundamentally, um, can you do that? So you have these images, can you use those? And this is what um, my student, uh, Joshua Hammond, is working with Michael Baldea on. Can you translate that, that data into um, more accurate predictions? So right now, we're looking at, um, it really doesn't look like you can take one sensor looking at the sky and do a real accurate prediction. You're always going to be limited. You can't see these clouds coming and things like that. 
So how many sensors do you need? So we have uh, four sensors in the field right now. We're looking at that. And then can you take that combined with like satellite data and get better, more accurate predictions of, of weather? Okay, so that's, that's one thing that we're looking at. Another thing is looking at residential solar. So now you have batteries, you got like a Tesla power wall, you've got your, your residential solar. And this is work done by Nya Tran, who's a postdoc uh, collaborating with, um, with Michael Balday and I also. And so uh, we're looking at what are the kind of optimum constraints or the optimum um, that you can get out of a, uh, your house with solar plus a battery looking at um, how much money might you save, uh, looking at resilience. Okay, so this is uh, kind of what a typical day looks like or several days. The green is a PV output. Again, you can see a lot of fluctuations. So clouds are coming over, uh, things like that. There are daily variations in the amount of power output. Uh, and these are things that you, you, need, you need to care about, okay? Um, you need to address the load in the yellow. Uh, if you have smart home appliances, you can kind of manipulate that to some extent. But again, uh, we're using different kind of electricity power demands uh, over time. So how does this PV production map on to our, our, <clears throat> our, um, our load? Okay. And so what we do is um, think about what if we add a, add, a add a battery? And then different markets are also different, okay? So in Texas, the price of our electricity doesn't fluctuate um, in most markets, but if you're in California, you have time of use pricing and things like that. So depending on where you're at, that, um, that matters as well. Okay. So this is, these are some simulations of uh, the solar output, your load, time of use pricing. And then if you add a battery, um, what does that uh, do to your, to your situation? So you can save some money, um, but not a whole lot right now. So if we compare, uh, I have um, no photovoltaic on my house, no solar cell, no battery. This is my electricity cost. If I have a photovoltaic, that's in the green here. If I have a uh, blue, this is the, the price I'm paying or, or saving um, with a photovoltaic and battery. And in the end, the battery is only saving you like a couple of percent right now. Uh, saving a lot, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of money. So we think about self-consumption and self-sufficiency. So self-consumption is the amount of your photovoltaic power you're generated that you use. And then self-sufficiency is, um, the, uh, uh, the amount of, uh, PV compared to the amount of, uh, electricity that, that you use uh, from the house. Okay, so in the green, that's the amount of solar uh, produced in the day. Yellow is the, is the load. The blue is basically your amount of uh, load that you're using from the solar. Without a battery, you're only addressing your load during the day when you have electricity. <clears throat> when you have a battery, uh, you have the ability to, to shift, the, shift the load. If you're interested in these slides, I'll have to provide them to you later. But the, the take home message is that um, with the battery, you can shift the load. So essentially, you charge the battery during the day when you have excess photovoltaic electricity. And then at night, you can use that battery to satisfy some of the Right now, you, there's no way, based on the battery constraints, with how big the battery is, how much solar you're generating, uh, to to meet the full demand of the house in, in general, okay? Uh, 
One other problem with the batteries is the round trip efficiency. So charging the battery, discharging it on the load, that efficiency is only 90%. So you're, you're losing 10% of your electricity. That's an issue. Warranty on your battery is only 10 years. That's an issue. Um, the, 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 the rate of charging versus the rate of, and the rate of discharging has a certain rate. Uh, sometimes that rate of charging can't keep up with the excess photovoltaic versus your load. That creates an issue. Okay, so charging rate, discharging rate, lifetime of the battery, uh, degradation of the battery over time. The more you're using it, the more you're degrading over time, even before uh, before it dies. And all of that's um, beyond just the cost of the battery of the system. Okay, so um, technologically, right now, I think it's possible that the next technological kind of revolution will be tandem solar cells with silicon and perovskite materials. Perovskites are uh, produced at kind of a room temperature, can be a solvent-based process. So the idea is silicon solar cell plus a perovskite layer in a manufacturing process that doesn't really increase the, the cost of manufacturing the silicon solar cell, but enables you to bump up your efficiency fairly significantly. And so this is what a lot of people are working on right now, and I think has uh, a lot of a lot of promise. Be sort of the next kind of revolution in, in solar. So um, I didn't show a lot of the solar cell data from my group, but I've had many students over the years work on that work on those materials. This is one of my students, Vikas Reddy, graduated a while ago with uh, Leslie Phillip, who's an undergrad, um, where they were making solar cells on paper. So they made these solar cells over these network devices, and they were so excited. They basically were running around the lab, wrapping them around like around their wrist and like solar wristband, uh, wrapping around a water bottle, solar water bottle, uh, all that. They were like really excited um, uh, about that. Those solar cells. You efficiency of those particular devices, uh, what we use them for. There are many um, sensors for the Internet of Things, kind of sensors that are out there that don't require a lot of current, but require voltage. So voltage-driven devices are kind of low-hanging fruit to put solar cells all over. You don't have to plug in your sensors. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot happening. And so the simulation work that I showed was done by Josh for the weather prediction, Nya for the um, looking at the kind of smart home, what can a battery get get you? Okay, and that, that work is done collaboratively with Michael Boldea, a colored mind and country. So anyway, I can answer any questions yet. Thanks. Thank you.